Next up, we have Patrick Feaster. Patrick Feaster rece received his doctorate in folklore and ethnomusicology in 2007 from Indiana University Bloomington, where he is now media preservation specialist for the Media Digitization and Preservation Initiative. A three-time Grammy nominee, co-founder of the First Sounds Initiative, and immediate past president of the Association for Recorded Sound Collections, he has been actively involved in locating, making audible, and contextualizing many of the world's oldest sound recordings. Patrick. Thanks, Jerry. I'd like you to imagine for a moment that you've been transported in a time machine back to the year 1873, let's say. And knowing your history, you think to yourself, 1873. Well, Alexander Graham Bell came up with his telephone in 1876, so that hasn't been invented yet. Edison came up with his phonograph in 1877. That hasn't been invented yet either. Well, I think what I'll do is I'm going to take credit for both of those inventions, since I already know about them. So here's your strategy. You seek out the leading experts in acoustics worldwide. And at this point, they're going to be in France, in England, in the various German states. And you go to them and make a pitch so that they'll, they'll vouch for the validity of your ideas. They'll say, OK, this will work. And so you go to them, and this is what you say. So you know, you, you take a membrane, a taut membrane, like, the, like your eardrum, and it picks up sounds out of the air. Here's what I want to do. Two great ideas. First, you take those motions and you cause them to vary in electrical current so you can reproduce those motions at the other end of a line. It could be in the next room. It could be 100 miles away. It could be 5,000 miles away. And as it vibrates, it'll reproduce the sound. You'd be able to understand someone's words. You could even recognize their voice. But that's not all. You can record those vibrations. And then, however many years later, the person could be dead. You can reproduce those vibrations from the record. You'll recognize their voice. People can speak from beyond the grave. This is going to be wonderful. What do you say? And your esteemed expert would look at you sympathetically and say, yes, I, I see where you're coming from with all this. And there was a guy named uh, Scott, I think, a few years ago, that came up with a similar idea. And it, it, it sort of makes sense. Uh, you know, a lot of people have speculated about this. You can buy popular science books. They'll go into it. But <clears throat> unfortunately, a better understanding of acoustic theory revealed you know, Scott was wrong. That's just not how membranes work. I mean, this idea that membranes will faithfully reproduce the sounds that they pick up. I mean, look. So, sorry, it's a great idea, but better luck next time. There's been a significant change recently in how scholars understand the origins of modern audio technology. Previously, historians had approached it mainly in terms of a technical problem, how to use the vibrations of membranes to mediate sounds across time and space. Today, the focus has shifted largely to the source of the idea that a membrane can be used to transduce sounds in the first place. In his influential book, The Audible Past, uh, Jonathan Stern represents the idea as an outgrowth of 19th stud uh, century studies of hearing. Acousticians and physiologists had then recently begun exploring how exactly the eardrum, or tympanum, uh, picks up sound vibrations from the air and transmits them to the inner ear so we can hear them. According to Stern's analysis, that investigation had established the principle that sound could be transduced mechanically by thin membranes, the tympanic principle, which was then applied pretty straightforwardly to the telephone, phonograph, microphone, and loudspeaker. I'd like to qualify this somewhat. It's true that these inventions were indebted to ongoing developments in acoustics. 
The inventors themselves repeatedly acknowledged the debt. However, there was no clear-cut expert consensus about the working of the eardrum that led unproblematically to them. Closer scrutiny of relevant scientific literature reveals a set of competing hypotheses that were on balance unfavorable to the emergence of audio technology as we know it today, right up until the advent of the Bell Telephone in the late 1870s, which proved it was possible by doing it. The title I've given my presentation is How Sound Recording Took On 19th Century Science. And you know academics, they always like these words you can take a couple different ways. This is no exception. Take on. On one hand, these people took on scientific ideas that they found out there as they tried to read up on what it was people were doing. But take on can also mean to contend with and contradict and fight against. So we have some of that too. So, how is it that sound recording took on 19th century science? At the end of the 18th century, physiologists already understood that the eardrum picks up sound vibrations from the air and transmits them through the middle ear to the labyrinth and auditory nerve. The trouble came when people tried to explain how this worked in terms of acoustic theory. The acoustic phenomenon that seemed to come closest was sympathetic vibration. Now, as Usually defined, sympathetic vibration happens when a, a physical body, such as a string on a musical instrument, is made to vibrate at one of its characteristic resonant frequencies by an external vibratory force with which it shares a harmonic relationship. For example, the vibrations of a nearby string tuned to the same pitch. Just one problem. We can hear sounds at lots of different pitches. But objects can enter into sympathetic vibration only at certain specific frequencies, each one associated with a different physical mode of division. Strings, for example, will enter into sympathetic vibration at certain frequencies that are all multiples of one another, but not at other frequencies. With uh, plates or membranes, the, the mathematics gets a little more complicated, but the principle is the same. <clears throat> they each have specific frequencies they'll vibrate readily at, and others they won't <clears throat> readily vibrate at, each one associated with different modes of division. <clears throat> Think here of someone hitting the head of a kettle drum. The, the surface of the drum divides itself in a particular way, parts of it move back and forth, as you see here. In fact, this principle had been popularized by Ernst Kladny in the late 18th century through uh, what he called tone figures. Uh, these were sound recordings of a sort, but they weren't recordings of sound over time. What he would do is he'd take <clears throat> a plate and he'd sprinkle sand over it, set it into vibration. The places that were moving a lot would thrust the sand aside, whereas the stationary parts that weren't moving, they're called nodes, would stay still, so the sand would gather along those nodes and make all of these, these patterns. So, thinking about things like this, in an effort to explain the eardrum in terms of sympathetic vibration, people suggested there had to be some way the eardrum is constantly tuning itself to incoming sounds so it can resonate with them, otherwise it wouldn't work. Erasmus Darwin and others tentatively attributed this role to a, the, the handle of the hammer, which is a tiny bone that varies the tension of the eardrum by pulling on it when a, a muscle contracts. And they, they thought it was doing something here, a little bit like tuning your vocal cords. In 1822, French acoustician Félix Savard presented a different explanation. He rejected this tuning idea at the outset, arguing it's absurd. Your eardrum would have to tune itself to pick up a sound before the sound had even been made. It's crazy. It couldn't possibly work this way. Instead, he claimed that a taut membrane, stretched membrane, would enter into sympathetic vibration indiscriminately with sounds of any frequency. There's no need to tune the eardrum. It doesn't need to be tuned. Now, Savar rested this claim on some experiments he'd carried out with apparatus built to simulate the mechanics of the ear. When he stretched a paper membrane over the mouth of a goblet, which is an artificial eardrum, and sprinkled it with sands, like Claudney had done, sounds of any frequency produced nearby caused the sand to jump and arrange itself into patterns that looked like those Claudney patterns. When he put a similar membrane over the narrow end of a cardboard cone with a little lever attached to its center so he could stretch it and vary its tension, 
he found that stretching it uh, caused the sand to jump less energetically, suggesting that changes in tension served merely to make the eardrum more or less sensitive, not to tune it, as people had been speculating. But Savar's claims didn't go unchallenged. In 1827, German physicist Wilhelm Weber disputed Savar's assumption that the membranes in his experiments had actually been resonating at all the various frequencies he'd studied. As he wrote, these discoveries of Savar's concern only the propagation of small oscillations in firm bodies in membranes. As here, it is not at all a question of sounding bodies, nor even resonating bodies, as one can be convinced by the sense of hearing, but of mere vibrations and soundless motions which, however, show much similarity with the motions of resonating and self-sounding bodies. What's he getting at here? Well, I'll refer to these two kinds of vibrations Weber differentiates as resonant and non-resonant vibrations. It's not absolutely uh, technically solid, but I think it'll explain things decently for our purposes. Resonant vibrations are the ones that actualize a body's characteristic resonances. The, the tendency, its own properties, give it a vibrating readily at certain frequencies, not at others. This is what you get if you pluck a string, you strike the head of a drum. But as Rudolf Koenig, the guy who built phonographs, observed in 1872, and I quote, Besides the vibrations which a body carries out under the influence of its elasticity, any movement whatsoever can naturally be forced upon it if only the force acting on it is significantly greater than the resistance it is capable of offering. This is a forced non-resonant vibration. It's independent of its own resonances. Think here of the pendulum of a clock. Left to its own devices, it'll tick, tock, tick, move back and forth at a specific rate. But if you're strong enough, you can grab it and force it back and forth however you want it to go. That's the difference here. Savar hadn't distinguished between resonant and non-resonant vibrations in his studies, which left his conclusions vulnerable to challenge, as we'll see. <clears throat> At first, though, Savar's conclusions about the eardrum were widely accepted. They made it into standard works on physiology including the treatise on physiology by Professor Langer. And as you heard a moment ago, Edouard Leon Scott de Martinville happened to be assigned this book for proofreading, and it led him to reason that it ought to be possible to document any sound passing through the air simply by recording the motions it produced in an eardrum-like membrane over time. Now, we sometimes like to say that he was inspired to do this by reading an account of how the human ear worked. Well, it, it was. But it's important to realize this was a very specific theory about the eardrum that had caught his attention, the one Savar had put forward in 1822. Scott set out to combine Savar's insight with another experimental tradition, the graphical method. In acoustics, the graphical method had until now involved attaching a stylus directly to a sounding body, something like a string or a vibrating rod or a tuning fork, so it could in inscribe its vibrations on a rapidly moving surface. Scott's idea is he's going to attach a stylus like this to an artificial ear, like the ones Savar had been using in his experiments years before. Scott first put this idea to the test in late 1853 or early 1854, trying to record the motions of paper membranes under the influence of speech and the sounds of a guitar onto flat plates made of glass moved by hand. Very, very primitive, but it, it seemed to be doing something. He resumed this work around the start of 1857, dubbed the process phonotography and the instrument of phonautograph. And, uh, patented a complicated apparatus that would have simulated not just the outer ear, that's this part, and the eardrum, but also the middle ear and the oval window designed to allow the user to vary the dimensions, the tension of the membrane, the internal air pressure, all things his readings suggested to him might be important, who knew? By the latter half of 1857, Scott had changed his strategy a bit. He's now recording things with just a single membrane to record on soot-covered sheets of paper wrapped around a rotating cylinder, and trying in this way to document singing, dramatic oratory, prayers, shouting, note, notes played on the cornet, as you heard. <clears throat> Meanwhile, though, he'd also started searching the resulting phonograms for correlations between visual patterns and the sounds that had produced them, uh, focusing particularly on the intonations of speech 
After all, he couldn't just play these recordings back and find out if he was on the right track. He had to look for evidence of this. So some of the correlations he found would be familiar to audio engineers today. For instance, he associated taller curves with greater intensity, more volume, more bunched together curves with higher pitch, and unmodulated traces, a flat line, with silence. And he seems to have worked most of these correlations out just experimentally. You, you see this kind of sound experimentally yields this kind of trace, so you know they go together. But his identification of one visual pattern with what he called waves of inflection was based on a particular theory of auditory physiology. Seemingly ordinary sound waves seemed to have other curves superimposed on them that were a lot taller and more spread out. Now, today we might you know, attribute this in hindsight to his equipment rocking back and forth at subsonic frequencies, a little bit like the, the motion of the, the, the screen here and the wind. But um, seeing that his phonautograms had these two different types of curve in them, Scott turned for an explanation to a French translation of Johannes Peter Müller's Handbuch der Physiologie des Menschen. Miller had written that the eardrum experiences both waves of condensation, waves that pass through the material of the eardrum itself, and waves of inflection, which cause the whole eardrum to move in response to especially intense sounds. Miller also considered the direction of sound waves important. If a sound wave followed a path perpendicular to the eardrum, he reasoned it would strike all parts of it at once, causing a uniform inward-outward movement. But he took the fact that the eardrum's positioned obliquely at an angle as meaning that sound waves would reach different parts of it at different times, producing complex three-dimensional deformations. And Müller speculated that the eardrum's ability to move in all these complicated ways rather than just in and out was what enabled it to recreate all the different forms of vibration that pass through the air, making possible our perception of timbre or sound quality. For example, a sound produced by a plucked string would make the eardrum vibrate a little bit like a plucked string. Scott identified smaller and larger phonographic curves with waves of condensation and waves of inflection, respectively, and he associated the waves of inflection with the three-dimensional movement of the eardrum, since he found he could record it better when his, his uh, membrane was at an angle. Um, so building on Miller's ideas about timbre perception, he believed that these complex waves of inflection carried extra information about the motions of bodies vibrating out there in the world that ordinary compression waves didn't. And that this additional data was crucial, absolutely crucial, for documenting the different sounds that make up spoken language. In addition to waves of inflection, for instance, he added to his key something he called timbre of membranous walls associated with the letter R, which he linked to a kind of wobbliness, which he supposed was due to a distinctive wobbling of the human speech organs as they made the sound, or something like that. In general, Scott concluded it was essential for his phonograph to record the complex three-dimensional deformation of its membrane, not just its motion inward and outward. To uh, put Scott's approach in perspective, the waveforms we use to represent sound waves today are two-dimensional graphs, where one axis represents time, the other represents fluctuations in amplitude, that is generally air pressure, as represented by the displacement of a membrane. Each point in time corresponds to one and only one measure of amplitude. By contrast, Scott believed that if he wanted to record the sounds of spoken language, he needed to capture the vibration of the membrane in an additional dimension. So if the stylus of his phonograph jumped up off the cylinder or traced lines that looped back on themselves, crazy looking stuff, he accepted this as meaningful data, where a modern recording engineer would interpret it simply as showing that the parts of his equipment were placed at wrong angles to each other. Scott's belief in the importance of membrane-twisting waves of inflection also sheds light on why he didn't pursue the playback of recorded sounds as sounds. In 1878, he self-published a book entitled The Problem of Self-Writing Speech, which includes a criticism of Thomas Edison's recently unveiled tinfoil phonograph, an instrument in which a stylus recorded the motions of a membrane by indenting a sheet of tinfoil into a groove 
and then retraced the indentations, conveying like motions back to a membrane and recreating the original sound. Scott's criticism has often been chalked up to sour grapes or to ideological stubbornness, but he actually offered a revealing technical challenge, uh, which I quote, thanks to a small cube of rubber in which the needle is fixed in Edison's machine, the point whipped about by the latter forms in the helicoidal groove depressions more or less deep, more or less elongated or spread out or oblique according to the force, the frequency, and the direction of impulse given by the voice. Scott wrongly assumed that Edison's phonograph documented the direction of sound waves through the obliqueness of its indentations, the result of waves of inflection twisting the membrane and making the stylus approach the tinfoil at different angles. Scott went on. During repetition, that is to say when the instrument alone is speaking, the needle is raised by the projection existing between two neighboring cavities and it is in falling back perpendicularly and by a sharp blow in the trough that the tympanum through the intermediary of the rubber receives a jolt like the card in the toothed wheel of Savar and obeying its own elasticity carries out a vibration which no longer conforms to the preceding one when the three dimensions of the prominence and those of the trough have changed. So because Edison's phonograph relied on a simple up and down motion of the stylus during playback, Scott reasoned that it couldn't handle the directional aspects of sound waves, which he thought were an essential part of speech. Instead, he assumed the stylus would just pass along a series of jolts to the membrane, kind of like the Savar wheel, another piece of Felix Savar's experimental equipment, where the teeth of a rotating wheel strike a card and produce sounds at frequencies that vary with the speed of rotation. So what does this mean? Scott is rejecting the idea of reproducing recorded sounds as sounds because it violated auditory theory as he understood it. The reason he left playback out of his own project may have been in part that that wasn't so important to him, but it also was not compatible with his understanding of how and why the phonograph worked in the first place, at least as a recorder of the human voice. <clears throat> Scott did rightly believe that his phonograph could document some of the same communicatively, artistically significant aspects of sound we associate today with sound reproduction. The difference, the elephant in the room, was that he assumed people would learn to read them by eye, either as originals or maybe via this kind of hybrid text, maybe hearing the performances imaginatively in their mind's ear. In retrospect, we might say he was right about the stuff of recorded sound, but not about how most people would end up accessing it. Now, Scott's views differed from those held by mainstream acousticians of his time. So next, I'd like to consider what they thought about the phonograph, what it could do, what it couldn't do. In 1859, Scott had entered into a contract with Rudolf Koenig, a manufacturer of precision instruments for the study of acoustics, giving him an exclusive commercial right to manufacture phonographs. The instrument that came out of their collaboration featured a plaster ellipsoid sound collector and introduced a few design changes which Scott credited to Koenig's suggestions. For example, Thinking in terms of resonant vibrations and the, these modes of division documented by Chladni's tone figures, Koenig was, worried, Koenig was worried about something. He worried that the spot where you attach the stylus might sometimes be on one of these non-moving parts, the nodes. And if it was on one of those parts, it wouldn't record anything. You'd just get a flat line. So with that in mind, he added something he called the subdivider of the membrane, a pin at the end of a movable arm that could be rested against different places on the membrane to change its nodal patterns as needed to make a record. Then, in 1860, bum, 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 Justin Bourget and Félix Bernard of the Faculty of Sciences of Clermont-Ferrand, I apologize for my pronunciation, presented a memoir on the vibrations of elastic membranes to the Academy of Sciences in Paris. They pointed out that Savard's theory of membrane vibrations contradicted mathematical theory. 
according to which membranes ought to have specific resonant frequencies, just like strings. They'd now carried out some experiments of their own, which they reported as disproving the claims Savar had put forward back in 1822. In passing, they remarked, a new instrument, the phonograph of Mr. Scott, rests upon these principles. <clears throat> so in other words, they believed one implication of their findings was that the Scott phonograph, which they persistently called the phonograph in their writings, wouldn't work. The popular science journal Cosmos leapt to Scott's defense, suggesting that they really should have tried out a phonograph for themselves before publishing this verdict, but when a Lengthier version of the memoir appeared in the Annals of Chemistry and Physics. The confutation of Scott's invention only intensified. They wrote that Savar had claimed first that membranes could vibrate at any frequency and second that they could pass continuously from one mode of division, one Chladni figure, to another by imperceptible degrees. These assertions, they said, are reproduced in all the classic works in an ingenious physicist, Mr. Scott has devised a phonograph that could not function unless the first law is absolutely true, not looking good. As Bourget and Bernard proceeded to spell out a case against Savar's theory based on their own studies of sand-strewn membranes, they again drew attention to the implications their argument had for the phonograph. So they point out, if you hold a membrane up to your ear and produce sounds next to it at different pitches, you can hear its vibrations don't faithfully follow them. <laughs> this alone, they write, shows clearly that the phonograph of Scott, you know, get the name right, guys, cannot give the result which he expects from it. The experts have spoken. For his part, Scott had already come to understand his phonograph unambiguously as a means of recording non-resonant vibrations in membranes. Uh, by the spring of 1860, he'd started experimenting with ways of preparing membranes specifically to dampen their resonances. He also mentioned experiments which had convinced him that the ear merely conducts vibrations and doesn't actually, quote, repeat sounds. And also that, quote, any point of the tympanum carries out and writes the same principal sound as all the other points, implying that all this business about nodal patterns and Chladni figures and resting things against places on the membrane didn't matter. You didn't need to do any of that. Within a few days of the initial presentation of Ber Bourget and Bernard's findings, though, he did make a change to his recording apparatus. He added an artificial chain of ossicles, that's the hammer, anvil, and stirrup, the bones of the middle ear. Uh, Bourget and Bernard, after all, had based their conclusions on membranes that didn't have ossicles attached to them, so uh, it was different from the human eardrum. So Scott thought maybe the ossicles would dampen the musical vibrations of the membrane in favor of non-resonant noises. Well, worth a try. Actually, the, the one recording we have made on this sounds pretty good. But Rudolf Koenig, the guy who had an exclusive right to manufacture and sell phonographs, his faith in the phonograph had been more deeply shaken by the arguments Bourget and Bernard had put forward. He verified to his satisfaction that it could record the fundamental frequencies of airborne sound waves which was the basis on which he continued to market it as a scientific instrument. So, for instance, he recorded the vibrations of a tuning fork directly, right next to a recording of the vibrations of another tuning fork picked up by a membrane. The number of vibrations matched. This is the same experiment that David described earlier being carried out by uh, Jules Sajou. However, Scott dropped Scott's central... Koenig, sorry. Koenig dropped Scott's central claim that the phonograph could document sound quality and spoken language like a hot potato. He didn't publish any account of it, his, of his own about this at the time, but scientific writers turned for information about the phonograph to him. He's the manufacturer and marketer. He had to know about these things. And accounts that uh, seem to reflect his revised views start to appear in print with uh, Dagon's elementary treatise on physics in 1861. He writes, as the membrane cannot vibrate under the influence of all sounds, and furthermore, the movements impressed on the stylus are not all pointed in the direction of the crest of the turning cylinder, one sees that it would be an exaggeration to say that the phonautograph is able to write the timbre of a voice to make known the syllables. 
So this, this claim that the superimposed vibrations at different frequencies would make the stylus move in different directions followed from the assumption that these would be resonant vibrations. They'd have these Chladni figure patterns to them. And that each, you know, if the stylus were placed at an ideal angle for recording the fundamental frequency of a sound, it would be at the wrong angle for recording at least some of the overtones. This would have meant that the membrane of the phonograph was incapable not only of resonating at frequencies outside a certain range, but also of recording simultaneously all the frequencies it could resonate at, making the notion that it could accurately capture complex sounds out of the air seem naive and unfounded. Koenig displayed a new model of phonograph at the London International Exhibition of 1862, which he'd redesigned to match his new sense of the instrument's limitations, rejecting Scott's own ideas and priorities in the process. The sound collector in the old model had been an ellipse with thick plaster walls, reflecting Scott's insistence on making it as non-resonant as possible. But Koenig now substituted a highly resonant zinc funnel Moreover, the old model had allowed the user to adjust the angle of the membrane, something Scott considered essential for recording waves of inflection and hence human speech. But Koenig eliminated this feature as unimportant, attaching the membrane permanently in a perpendicular position. Alongside these design changes, Koenig's understanding of the phonograph at this point can be gleaned indirectly from arguments relayed by two people who visited his London exhibit and discussed it with him. The French mathematician astronomer Jean-Charles Rodolphe Radeau summarized the arguments of Bourget and Bernard in the journal Cosmos, commenting, I love this quotation, these results show clearly how illusory and without a future were certain attempts to use membranes for the autography of speech. The Austrian physicist Franz Josef Pisco presented the same arguments as Rodeau in an article published in the Annual Report of 1863 of the Wiedner Kommunal Schule in Vienna, where he taught, concluding that it was, quote, clear that the expectation of the inventor Scott that his invention would give differing autograms of words had to remain unfulfilled. He went further than Rodeau, however, by extending the critique to cover another recent invention. A few years earlier, Johann Philipp Reis, a German school teacher, had invented a telephone that was supposed to transmit sounds over a distance by electricity. Now, one of the few sources Reis credited with inspiring him was Karl Fuhrort's Outline of Human Physiology, published in 1860, which had contained what was probably the first ever print publication of a picture of a phonotogram of the human voice. So we can say that Rice's telephone was inspired, at least indirectly, by Scott's work. Like Scott, Rice tried to read up on how the ear works, and in his case, he landed on a model where sounds are transmitted through the bones of the middle ear by the hammer striking the anvil more or less forcibly. If that were true, <clears throat> then audible sound had to consist of simple pulses of varying strength. That's all a system like that could transmit, rather than more complicated waveforms. And so the, the phonautograms pictured in Fjord's book seem to look reasonably consistent with that view. And Reis even drew some similar graphs of his own to illustrate what he thought a speech signal might look like. Here you see, in the one case, every second wave or every second pulse uh, a little bit stronger, in the second case, every third impulse. So bearing this model of sound and hearing in mind, Reis designed his telephone so that when sounds made a membrane vibrate, each impulse would make and break an electric circuit, with stronger impulses holding it open for longer than weaker ones. At the other end of the line, the making and breaking of the circuit was supposed to produce corresponding sounds in an electromagnet by means of magnetostriction. Unlike Scott, <clears throat> Rice could gauge the success of his experiments just by listening to the results. As it happened, these were sometimes good enough to suggest he was onto something, but not consistently good enough to prove he was right. In retrospect, we know that simply making and breaking a circuit can't transmit intelligible speech. Whenever Rice succeeded in doing this, which apparently he sometimes did, it was because his equipment wasn't working quite the way he meant it to. Instead, you need a signal of varying intensity, an electrical signal of varying intensity, as in the later Bell telephone. But nobody knew that yet in the 1860s. 
and Pisco dismissed Rice's telephone simply for relying on a membrane to pick up sound in the first place. He characterized it as, quote, in substance, a membrane phonautograph, and therefore subject, subject to the same objections. He writes, what the phonautograph cannot accomplish in its simplest form and nearby, is it to be able to proffer any more complicated form at a distance? Certainly not. Simultaneous concerts, song productions in different cities are at present still, still some time away. <clears throat> the phonautograph cannot serve to reproduce a concert. Again, the experts have spoken. Uh, this publication didn't go so far, but a few years later, he published the main book on instruments for studying acoustic technology, Die Neueren Apparate de Acoustique, published 1865. So his views were pretty influential. Now, it's true that the theories Hermann Helmholtz put forward in Die Lehre von den Tonempfindungen in 1863 offered a clear explanation during this period for how a single wavy line could represent complex sounds as the mathematical sum of simple waves corresponding to fundamentals and overtones. And here he and Scott were in agreement. One of Helmholtz's diagrams is shown here on the left, one of Scott's on the right. It's basically the same idea. Nevertheless, in this magnum opus, Helmholtz treats membranes in the phonograph as subject only to resonant vibrations. And his major writing on the mechanism of the eardrum itself, where this all started, which was first published in 1868, didn't bode well for the idea of membrane-based sound technologies either. He argued the function of the middle ear, you know, it's not necessarily to transmit complex vibrations faithfully to the labyrinth. All that's necessary is for vibrations of the same type to be transmitted in a way that lets people perceive them the same way each time. So according to this argument, the vibrations transmitted at various points within the ear might differ greatly from those present out there in the air. So you couldn't harness one necessarily to reproduce the other. Moreover, Helmholtz's own analysis of the way the eardrum worked emphasized the importance of the way it was curved, the, the fact that it had radial fibers built into it that tra could translate tiny variations of air pressure into relatively large forces exerted on the bones of the middle ear. The phonograph and telephone hadn't borrowed these elements, and in a follow-up article of 1871, Pisco cited this new study in an effort to explain why the eardrum could accurately mediate all audible sounds, even though the membrane of the phonautograph couldn't. Overall, Helmholtz's arguments didn't encourage membrane-based sound technologies so much as raise further doubts about their viability. I meanwhile, Rudolf Koenig was no stranger to the concept of playing waveforms to produce corresponding sounds. Since 1867, he'd been working on an instrument himself known as the Wellensirena, or wave siren, which produced sounds by aiming a narrow jet of compressed air at waveforms cut into the edges of rotating metal disks and cylinders. So taking a complex waveform and converting it into sound wasn't, wasn't a problem as far as he was concerned. The trouble was with recording complex sounds in the first place. He didn't think attaching a stylus to a membrane would do the trick. And he doesn't seem really to have changed his mind even after the unveiling of Thomas Edison's speaking phonograph in 1877 and 78. How do we know? Back in April of 1877, the French poet and inventor Charles Crow had deposited a sealed packet with the French Academy of Sciences describing a process of photo engraving Scott phonograms so that they could be mechanically played back. The idea itself is perfectly sound, I and mean, people later tried it. It was, was difficult to get to work, but it, it works. But in 1878, Tivadar Pushkash told a journalist, I have the opinion of Mr. Koenig that it is highly improbable Mr. Crow could ever construct an instrument which would work practically. He might labor at it 10 years and be no nearer a satisfactory result than he was at first. Bearing Koenig's own wave siren in mind, it wasn't the, the business of playing back or playing a waveform that was a problem. It was this matter of recording sound. Koenig actually had his own device for picking up 
sound waves of speech and things like that. It was the, the manometric flame apparatus. In this case, a membrane would compress lighting gas and feed it to a flame that would flicker in, in the, the flickering would, would basically indicate your, your composite waveform. Now, why would he think this would work when the phonograph wouldn't? Maybe one reason was he invented this. He didn't invent the phonograph. But another explanation would be that all you're doing is compressing gas. You don't have to worry about those pesky nodal patterns getting in the way. Now, you might be saying to yourself, how could anybody have doubted that a membrane could pick up speech sounds and send them across a distance? Didn't everybody know about the mechanical telephone, the thing we know is the tin can telephone? After all, people often say this is an ancient invention. People have known about this since antiquity. Of course, nobody could know about this thing and not realize that a membrane can pick up the sounds of the human voice. So this whole thing is silly, right? Actually, the mechanical telephone as we know it, the string can telephone, was not known in the United States or in Europe until about this time, in the middle of the 1870s. Uh, in fact, it first came to the United States, and this, this only turns up in some later court testimony, in a letter written by Henry Shepard Wetmore from Lima, Peru, on November 4th, 1875, to his father in Milwaukee, telling him about this toy that he'd found on the street there that people were using. So it turns out, yes, in certain parts of the world, South America, India, and so on, there were mechanical telephones going way, way, way back. But not in Europe and not in America. Elisha Gray talks about seeing one of these very first lover's telephones, as they were called commercially here, and that this, this finally got him over a conceptual hurdle in his own effort to, to develop a speaking telephone. So, Bearing this in mind, these points that Scott was pushing for might have been much better received in India or in Persia or in South America. But Western science, for some reason, seems to have been unusually predisposed not to accept this idea about membranes being able to pick up vibrations out of the air faithfully which, among other things, underscores just how innovative Scott's breakthrough was in terms of the Western tradition. Now, by the same token, the case against the phonograph was very much a European thing. This argument that you couldn't use membranes to mediate sound was made almost exclusively in French and German language publications. Not much about this in English. Now, American institutions had phonographs. The first one seems to have been imported uh, by Charles Banker of Philadelphia in 1859, later ended up at the Stevens Institute in uh, Hoboken. There was also one at the Smithsonian, one at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. But American scholars hadn't been following the debate about it. They just knew about the machine. There was a graduate student named Charles Anson Morey at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology that gave him a project, redesign the phonograph based on what we think it's, is wrong with it, and he did. But what they thought was wrong with it had nothing to do with any of the reasons put forward in Europe at this time. They just wanted some practical design details tweaked. When Alexander Graham Bell went to the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in 1874 to study vowel sounds using that phonograph, which is often credited with helping inspire his work on the telephone, the first time that this whole set of ideas was proven beyond doubt, there would have been nobody there to argue with him, to tell him, you can't really do that with a phonograph. See, here are all these articles in, in European journals that say that won't work. So let's go back to my initial anecdote, or whatever you want to call it, the thing where I you know, told you to imagine yourself back in time, in the year 1873. So I explained what would happen if you went up to an expert in France or Germany or England. But if you'd said the same thing to one of the leading experts in the United States, they likely would have said, yeah, yeah, sounds pretty good. Knock yourself out. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>
Thanks, Patrick. Amazingly, it's 3.01, so we're right, we're right on time. Um, we're going to take a half hour break, and we'd like to invite you to have some refreshments in the back. Please take a look at our, our exhibit. Um, and the restrooms are down the steps in this direction and turn right. Please uh, be back to your seats by 3.30. Thank you. <laughs>